The following are the recordings from the World's Cleanup Day virtual lecture series hosted by Bye Bye Plastic Bags, Pennsylvania. The video from these particular lectures are not available due to a technical error during the lectures themselves. However, the audio recordings are as follows, starting with the very first lecture from Ms. Emily Johns, high school coordinator at the Phipps Conservatory and Botanical Gardens. Um, and how you might be able to do it at your organization or at home or in your community. Um, but really, I didn't want to just like, my example is focused on um, reducing plastic use and waste, um, which I thought felt really, fit really well with World Cleanup Day. Um, but really, I wanted to talk about some approaches that you could kind of do for, for anything that you care about or are passionate about. Um, so that's why my title is, is so long. Um, so, um, I work at Epic's Conservatory, um, and if you're from Pittsburgh, um, in the area, um, you probably know at least something about it, because um, it's kind of, you know, it's got this iconic glass house, um, and, it, you know, people really love to go there in the wintertime, so it has a good, you know, reputation in the community, but something that's maybe not um, always talked about as much is um, kind of our journey of how we, we've gotten here and how focused we are on um, the environment. So I just will take it back just for a couple minutes, a tiny history lesson. Um, this opened in 1893, which is over 125 years ago. Um, so I like to think, even though uh, back in 1893, it wasn't quite, um, wasn't quite, you know, we didn't have quite the same mission that we do today, but it was still a way um, that people um, were able to connect to nature um, and connect to that feeling of, of being around plants and open air. Um, and so, you know, that kind of has been in Phipps Conservatory for a long time. But um, in 1993, um, we became um, a nonprofit. We used to be on the, or, you know, part of the city. Um, so at that point is when we kind of started to shift into the fix that we have today. Um, and, and with that, I'm going to put up our mission, um, which is to inspire and educate all with the importance and beauty of plants to advance sustainability and promote human and environmental well-being through action and research and to celebrate our historic glass house. So that's a mouthful, um, but I wanted to focus on one main part. Um, and that's the connection of human and environmental well-being and health. Because, you know, a lot of organizations are focused on um, environmental science and research and that kind of thing. Um, but making sure that the human health is also considered is, is really important to us. Um, and along with that, we have um, something else that's really helped us drive positive change, which is using a regenerative approach. Um, so the idea of a regenerative approach is that instead of just um, a sustainable approach, which um, sustainability we talk about all the time, it's really great, um, but sustainability is this idea of keeping things the same, um, steady, you know, that will last. Um, and with regenerative, instead of thinking, how can we do less bad? How can we keep things the same? Um, we're thinking, how can we do more? How can we do good? It's the idea of abundance and growth. So this regenerative approach um, has been kind of how we've approached and made changes as an organization over the last um, 25 years. Um, picture here, this is one of our green buildings. Uh, this is the rooftop of our office building. And, and here's the, the outside of the building. So that picture was up on the roof, uh, which you can't see from here. Um, and this is our office building. This is our Center for Sustainable Landscapes. Um, and it wasn't our first green building on campus. Um, but I, I'm gonna, I know the most about this one, so I wanted to, to talk just a little bit about it. And then we'll get more into like, plastics and, and what you can do. Um, but this building has all of these certifications. You can see them at the bottom. And, and you've probably heard of some of them, like Green Building Challenge. Um, and living building or living building challenge, green building certification, um, and these are all these certifications. 
recommendations get for your building and they're based on points. Um, but we wanted, you know, it was important to us from the beginning that these certifications not be just about the points. Um, we're not just focusing on getting the certification for the sake of getting the certification. We really want to do, um, you know, do good things and be a model for other organizations of, of how they can really do the best that they can. Um, and another, another certification here, we have the, the well certification. So our building does really focus on human health as well as environmental health. Um, this is through things like not sourcing furniture that has chemicals like formaldehyde in it, um, or um, just encouraging healthy practices every day, like having out healthy snacks, um, or you know, encouraging people to take the stairs instead of the elevator. So providing kind of this built-in, um, you know, emphasis on health that that not only impacts people when they're there working, but impacts you know their lives at home as well. Um, and and I just you know I I won't bore you too much with all all of this like history and details about this particular building, um, but the site that it was built on. Um, is a good example of using that regenerative thinking. So this area down here, this is kind of behind the main conservatory. Um, if you look to the right of this picture, that glass building up there is our tropical forest. So this is behind the, the big glass house. It sits down back on like kind of a, a hill slope. Um, so this site was really contaminated. There used to be a garage down there. Um, that had leached a lot of things into the soil. Uh, and so a sustainable thing to do might have been to just dig out the soil, uh, put in some fill, make sure it was safe enough to build a building there uh, and move on. But when we put, uh, put this building in, the idea with the site was, how can we make this site really purposeful and um, having a, a positive impact on the area? How can we have this growth, this more good instead of less bad? Um, so things that the site includes, it captures rainwater um, for use um, in our garden, our um, greenhouses. It has some living filters built in for wastewater. Um, it was planted with a native landscape. So we see tons of animals here. It's, it's really fun to work there. There's always deer and there's like, there was a heron this past year. Um, so the native landscape really um, adds uh, kind of passageway for animals, especially since we're so close to um, Shelley Park. Um, and then the area is just really refreshing too for, for the humans that work there, like me. Um, the whole area is, is a great space to recharge. It's really relaxing. And I really miss it. I'm working from home right now. Um, but normally, you know, go, walking in there every day was... Yeah, such a highlight and such a relaxing, uh, beautiful landscape. So that's just an example of how um, how we kind of incorporated that regenerative idea into some of our projects. Um, and then this slide is super boring, but I, this is just a quick timeline um, of some of the changes that we've made throughout the last, um, this is about, you know, 15 or so years, um, a lot of changes in our cafe. So especially related to plastics, um, we, you know, we got rid of plastic disposables, water bottles, um, and, and changed it, like thought a lot more about sourcing food and what kind of food we wanted to serve, thinking about that human health component. Um, and then further things like, divesting from fossil fuels and our investments, um, things like that, um, you know, they can seem really daunting to an organization, um, but they, they make such a difference and they really, we've tried to serve as a model too for other um, greenhouse, you know, conservatories, museums, um, and just organizations in general. Um, and then an example of this, like thinking more good instead of less bad, um, just a couple years ago, we been using compostable um, containers in our cafe. And yeah, that's kind of more of that less bad mindset. So we really tried to reduce even the compostable materials that we were using. Um, just trying to, to keep, keep doing it and keep the work going. Um, and then just last year, so this timeline kind of lists a lot of more like top-down um, 
organizational changes. But just last year, we did something really fun, and it was a hackathon. I don't know if any of you have done uh, a hackathon at school or at your organization, um, but it was just this like creative brainstorming event, um, and it brought together staff from all across FIPS. And our, our goal was like, how can we produce single-use plastics here at FIPS? And you know, that doesn't seem that complex, I guess. But it really was, and it, it brought together people that don't usually work together. We're a big, um, a pretty big organization, and we have, um, we even have like different office spaces. Um, I can go days without seeing some of the people that I work with. So it really brought people together. Everyone had different background knowledge, um, different perspectives of how they see the work that they do. Um, and we came together and we met in these um, interdepartment teams and just had a whole day to do this creative problem solving. Um, and throughout the day, we started with um, kind of some education from um, Justin Stockdale of the Pittsburgh Resource Council. You've ever heard him talk. He's super passionate and super knowledgeable. Um, and just like he was a great way to start the day, very inspiring. Um, and then we, you know, broke into our working groups, um, but there were lots of times to pause and, and take breaks and refresh. So like these little post-it notes were um, near the beginning, we wrote down um, kind of our reason for wanting to participate and our reason that this mattered to us. Um, and so these were a couple people's um, feelings about that. Um, and then we had like working lunch, there were yoga breaks, um, very refreshing. When I saw a six hour workshop on my calendar, I was, oh, six hours, I'm gonna be exhausted. Um, but it was really done in a way that encouraged creativity and sharing and was really solutions focused, which in my opinion, gives a lot more energy and, um, yeah, motivation. If you're focused on solutions, it can feel a lot less daunting because you're working with you know, you're working with a team that cares about the same things and you're focused on solutions instead of the problems. Um, so the day concluded and we had, just from that day, we had a number of things that we realized we could take action on right away because um, maybe one department was already doing something and they said, you can tag along with your problem, it fits really well with mine. And an, an example of this is our horticulture department um, gets a lot of plants that are wrapped in brown paper. Um, and we use a, a service called AgriCycle. That's a composting service. Um, and in the office building, um, a lot of us knew that AgriCycle would also take office paper and brown paper bags and things like that. Uh, but horticulture didn't know that they'd just been using it as compost for plants. Um, and so that was a great, a great way of, to just kind of make that change today. You know, we were like, oh, we we'll put the brown paper in the compost, and we checked with the agri cycle. Can we put this much brown paper in the compost? And they were like, yeah, absolutely. So it was like changes like that that happened just from that one day that was really inspiring. Um, but that's not all. Of course, we had to keep it going because you can't just have some ideas and then you know, stop thinking about them. Um, so we built uh, a task force. So it's a lot smaller. It's still made up of um, staff members from different departments. Um, and it meets about once a month. Um, and their, their goal is to keep the ideas from the hackathon um, and move forward with those, but also keep finding um, little things that we can do. And, and like I said, with the hackathon, some, uh, some solutions were really simple. Like, oh, put the brown paper in the compost. Don't put it in the recycling. Uh, but then, you know, some of those can make a big difference. Um, and then some of our solutions, you know, we're working on are much bigger. So we're working on um, getting a single stream uh, waste source or uh, waste company. Um, and we, we've talked about maybe, you know, plastic pelleting um, for some of our harder to recycle uh, plastic numbers that come in a lot of our plastic pots. So some of those ideas are much bigger. Um, but 
there's a lot of simple things that have come out of this task force that maybe, you know, we would have just kept doing the same old, same old thing. Um, so that's been, been really, really cool to see. Um, and I have here like communication, collaboration, celebration, um, because those are three things that are, are really important um, to keep the task force going. So one, communication, um, not only within the task force, which is made up of different departments, but communicating that back to the departments. Um, and then communication on an outward facing scale. So here we have like this compost bin um, and they, the task force had our uh, interpretive specialists make a new sign for it because I don't know if, if you've had this problem, but every municipality has different um, cycling requirements. Um, if you go to different compost, depending on if it's a machine compost, if it's a backyard compost, there's different requirements. Um, and so it makes it really hard for you know people to just go in and, and maybe you bought a cup of soup. And it can be really daunting to know what do I do with this, this cup of soup when I'm done? Um, and so making really clear communication in our signage um, and in our all of our um, you know our website and that kind of stuff. So communication throughout is super important. Um, and then collaboration. So I mentioned that um, departments shared, oh, we're doing this, you should do this too. And, and collaboration isn't just good for things like this task force. Um, coming together for the hackathon, um, build relationships with the, our other departments that helps beyond plastics, maybe, you know, like help with our programming. Just building collaboration in your organization or your community can really make you more productive um, and make your programming better. So big, a big advocate for collaboration um, and celebration. So I, I think a lot of you probably watching this or on the call right now um, are involved in some sort of environmental work. And so you know that it can get really discouraging and, and exhausting sometimes. Um, and a focus on celebration can really be like the spark that keeps you going. So making sure you take time to pause and say, look at what we've done so far. Um, look at what maybe a small task force, we've already made these changes. Um, and making sure that you take time to celebrate. Because if you work to exhaustion, then you're not going to have, you know, your energy stores are going to be empty for when that next project comes along. Um, and I, I like our task force, so I'm, actually, I'm not on the task force. I met with them before this uh, presentation to kind of get an update. Um, but they, they always say, like, that was a win. So I like, I like that for I mean, but you can sell there however you want. But they always, they highlight all their wins every, every month. Uh, so just kind of from there, um, I, I think that there's a lot now, I mean, obviously, this list, what can you do? This is not comprehensive. Um, but there's a lot you can learn just from this. I, I think the hackathon uh, was a really creative event um, and encouraging, you know, collaboration, which I said, I really love collaboration. Um, but you don't have to just do it at your organization. Maybe you do it at your school. Maybe you do it at your home. Maybe you get your family together on a rainy day. Um, and you look around your house and say, what could we do differently? What could we change? Um, what solutions are kind of, you know, maybe there's some easy things that you could change as a family. Um, so I think, I think there's a lot that you could, um, you could take home or take to, to almost anywhere. Um, and it doesn't have to be focused on plastics. Maybe it's, it's something else that you're really passionate about. Um, and education. So, you know, we have Justin Stockdale come in, um, but if you're really, if you really care about something, um, but maybe you're not sure you know everything about it, learn about it. Um, or if you really care about something and you do know a lot about it, share what you know. Um, that's, you know, education is kind of the foundation for all of this. If we learn about something um, and understand it, then we can know how to go forward. Um, and then these last things, I know that we can't put all of our pressure for environmentalism on individuals. Um, we, we can do a lot, and what we do is important. Um, but you know, 
know, sometimes there's a lot of pressure put on individuals when, you know, some things are, are bigger, systematic things. Um, but small things you can do are, are supporting and amplifying organizations um, that are doing things that, that you appreciate, um, supporting legislation that aligns with changes you want to see, um, and then those last three, communicate, collaborate, and celebrate. So I hope that you all celebrate today because um, this event is super amazing. Um, and there's a bunch of speakers lined up today that all have um, amazing work to talk about. Um, so I hope that you can take today and celebrate, um, build that energy up so that you can move forward and, and do amazing things. Um, so thank you for listening um, and joining us this morning. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. And if you'd like to contact me, uh, this, this is my email address. At, oops. Huh. Yeah, thank you so much. If there are any questions, you can ask them now. Otherwise, we can move on to our next lecture. Okay, then I guess that's a consensus on let's move on. <laughs> all right, thank you all. Thanks, Trina. Thank you. Okay, so the next lecture, also if you didn't hear at the beginning, we're by by Plastic Bags. We're an international organization aimed at reducing plastics use, specifically from the perspective of youth. And welcome to our virtual lecture series for World Cleanup Day. So our next speaker is Dr. Sherry Mason, who is a chemistry professor and leading researcher in freshwater plastic pollution. Her award-winning work has drawn international attention to the threats posed by microplastics and led to the passage of national measures banning microbeads. She currently serves as sustainability coordinator at Penn State Theory, the Barron College, and she'll be speaking about plastic pollution in the Great Lakes.
crude oil refinery in the United States. Um, it's down located along the coast of, of Texas, um, in an area that is uh, affectionately referred to as uh, Cancer Alley. <laughs> um, it's an area I grew up in, and um, it's you know the the pollution that's associated with this. I think you know gives you the idea of why it's called Cancer Alley. And yet the real question is, is that now they're starting to turn their attention and will Appalachia, our area of the world, become the next cancer alley? That is the intention, um, is to, to create this build out of uh, cracker plants that are going to take wet uh, fracked gas and turn it into polyethylene. I think another issue with plastic is just trying to wrap our heads around how much plastic is out there. We've seen this exponential increase since the end of World War II to the point where we were producing 448 million tons in 2015, five years ago. Um, the industry is looking to quadruple its plastic production by 2030. Um, it's kind of unreal numbers. Um, it's several tens of thousands of olympic sized swimming pools full of plastic that we manufacture every year and the question is where does it go um as a material it's it's quite uh, unique in that it doesn't biodegrade uh, because it is uh, not of nature nature doesn't really know how what to do with it um, and so instead it goes through a process called photo degradation where it breaks into smaller and smaller pieces um, that retains its uh, chemical properties of being a plastic. So even as it gets smaller and smaller, it still has those chemicals in it. It still will stick chemicals on the outside. Um, it just becomes easier to uh, move from the external environment into the food chain as it gets to these smaller and smaller pieces. I know a lot of people, when you say, well, what happens to plastic? They say, well, I recycle it. Um, and if you've been paying attention to the news at all, you'll realize um, week after week we get more and more stories about how um, the recycling of plastic is, is really um, just a huge lie. Um, in fact, there was an NPR story just last week or just earlier this week um, about this and I encourage people to, to go out and seek that information. Um, it was a, a really well done story and it, it, it uh, builds off the uh, story that was shown on a public TV um, over the summer. In fact, more plastic is actually burned than is recycled. And if burning plastic sounds like a really bad idea, well, you're right, it is. It's a really bad idea. <laughs> Um, all sorts of all those chemicals that are in and on plastic turn into uh, super chemicals <laughs> um, when in the incineration process, um, most notably forming dioxins, which are the most toxic substances known to man. Um, for, well, very, very well known carcinogens, and they have impacts at parts per trillion levels. Um, it does end up uh, in landfills every year, but if you add up all of those numbers, you'll see that they do not add up to 100, and that's because a substantial amount of plastic ends up in our waterways every year. I think a lot of people, when they think about this issue, they think about the world's oceans, um, and, and rightfully so, um, and that's really where the research started, but the question is, how does it get to the oceans? Because not all of us live on the oceans. Um, a report came out from the United Nations uh, 2004 showing that um, most of what we find in the oceans is making its way through freshwater systems. So that plastic bag you see blowing in the breeze makes its way into a river which flows into a lake and then all bodies of water eventually flow into the oceans. So the point is, is that it's making its way through freshwater systems and we happen, well I happen, <laughs> to live on the largest freshwater system. Um, in the entire world, and that is the Great Lakes. Um, and uh, anybody in Pennsylvania, um, you know, you're, you're connected to, to either the Great Lakes or to um, the Chesapeake Bay um, or the Mississippi River watershed. So one way or another, your, your, your plastic is making its way into these freshwater systems and from these freshwater systems making its way into the oceans. Um, let me use the Great Lakes to exemplify this point because it's the, the area of, of research that I've been focused on. Um, up in Lake Superior, we see an average of 30,000 pieces of plastic per square kilometer. This is the very beginning of the Great Lakes uh, chain. Um, it's 
considered a, a very pristine lake um, because there's so few people that live along it, and yet we already see 30,000 pieces of plastic. Lake Huron is kind of an anomaly, um, and I think it's just because it's a little study that we see much, we see 10 times less uh, plastic in Lake Huron. But if we go over to Lake Michigan, which um, geologically speaking, these two lakes are actually one lake. Um, they're just the, the peninsula of Michigan sticking up in the middle there. <laughs> Um, but they're on the same, uh, ge geologically, they're, they're one lake. Um, and so we see an average of 17,000 particles um, of plastic per square kilometer of the lake surface, unlike Michigan, which probably gives you a better idea of what we're actually seeing in Lake Huron. That water flows into Lake Erie, the lake that I live on, and that number increases up to 46,000 pieces of plastic per square kilometer. Um, not a, a huge surprise there because there, um, Lake Erie is the most populated of the Great Lakes, um, and so you're going to see a, a significant increase. As, as significant an increase as that is, they're blown away when you look at Lake Ontario with an average of a quarter of a million pieces of plastic per, per kilometer. When you take into account the, the surface area of these lakes, you see that each of the lakes has billions of particles um, uh, stretched across the entire lake surface. What's um, intriguing about these is, is that the size. Um, we break our plastics up into microplastics and macroplastics based upon the size. And you'll see that the um, vast majority of these particles are less than one millimeter in size. Um, so basically, picture a period at the end of the sentence, and that's the size of plastic that we're talking about. So I always tell people, when you go and you look at a body of water, you don't see plastic, don't think that it's not there. <laughs> it's just too incredibly small for you to see. And maybe aesthetically that makes you feel a little bit better, but the reality is those small pieces of plastic are very easy to adjust. To give you an idea of what these look like, I'm gonna show you some pictures. Fragments are the most common type. These are things that broke down off of something that's bigger. Um, the pellets, um, these are got a, quite a bit of press um, when our work started back in 2012 um, because of their connection to microbeads that were found in personal care products. Um, and then fibers are becoming the new story um, when it comes to microplastics. These come off of our clothes when we wash and dry them, um, probably in the manufacturing of clothing. Um, you know, as we're using our camping equipment outside, you know, these, these little fibers will break off and shred um, and be released into the environment. As we speak about fibers, it makes me think of some other studies that we've done. Um, and just really driving the point home that this isn't just like a water issue that somehow doesn't affect us, it's making its way into things that we consume. Uh, so we did a study looking at um, three um, consumables, human consumables, sea salt, um, where we found an average of 212 particles per kilogram of sea salt. Beer, <laughs> for obvious reasons, that we like to have beer. Um, <laughs> trying to make this real to people. Um, these were all brewed using Great Lakes water. Um, I, do not, I want to make it clear, I'm not talking about Great Lakes brewery beer. <laughs> it was beer that was used using Great Lakes water. Um, found an average of four particles per liter um, of beer. And then a, a global tap water assessment, we looked at 159 samples that were collected across the globe and found on average about five and a half pieces of plastic per liter of tap water. To make this these numbers, which seem kind of odd, a little bit more real, what this means in terms of what you'd actually be consuming through these, you'd be consuming about 180 particles of plastic from your sea salt usage, about 520 particles from drinking beer, average adults, of course, um, the vast majority of what you'd be taking in would be coming just simply through the act of drinking tap water. Um, most of these particles are fibers, um, like we were just discussing. Um, and lest you think that, oh, okay, I just won't drink tap water. I'll drink bottled water. Oh, don't worry. You're not safe there either. Um, it tells you how well they've marketed these these products that we think that if we wrap our water in plastic, it's going to somehow have less plastic in it. <laughs> I'm not sure how. <laughs> how um, they, they've done a really good job of marketing. So we, we tested 11 different brands um, that were purchased from across the globe, and in total was 259 bottles, individual bottles of water, um, usually about 10 bottles from each of the um, 
the uh, packages that we purchased. Um, we did brands multiple times if they were um, manufactured in multiple locations. So Nestle Pure Life, we got it from what, three different locations, Thailand, Lebanon, um, as well as in the United States. Aquafina, we, multi- we also um, uh, obtained in a couple locations. Um, but other places like Avion and, and Geralstein are only packaged at a source, and so they will only have um, stamp What we found is that 93% of individual bottles of water showed evidence of microplastic contamination with about twice as much plastic as compared to tap water. But with bottled water, um, this study came out a little bit later and we were able to um, use different methods so we could go to smaller particle sizes and we found 314, on average, 314 particles per liter um, in particles that are smaller than 100 microns. To give you an idea of 100 microns, that's about the width of a human hair. So we're looking at particles that are thinner than than the width of your human hair again, I get is incredibly small and you're thinking, well, why does that matter? These are actually the particles that can make their way across your gastrointestinal tract, be carried through your body, and end up in your liver, your kidneys, and even your brain. Unless you think that I'm just making that stuff up. No, people are studying it, not me. (laughs) Other people. Um, And it's happening. Um, It's very, very real. Um, And this this does, um, this does occur. Um, And these particles can be passed um, from um, a mother to a fetus um, in vitro. Um, And those studies are also being done at uh, Rutgers University in New Jersey. Um, The particles that we saw was really interesting for me um, with the, with regard to the bottled water study that we did was um, how different the, the kind of makeup of the particles were. So unlike in the, tap water where most of the particles were um, fibers and therefore probably making their way into tap water through the air, um, within bottled water, the vast majority of them are fragments, which really tells you that you have a much different kind of source of those particles um, coming. Um, Even more so, we looked at the type of polymer that was in there, and we found polypropylene to be the most common um, with polyethylene being kind of up there, um, that's the PE and the PEST. Those happen to be the same uh, polymers that are used to make the bottle and the cap. Um, so the point is, is that it seems that the vast majority of contamination with bottled water is coming through the actual act of bottling the water. Um, unlike what we see in tap water, where probably the source of contamination is largely coming from. So all of that data, all of that science that I just presented is really just trying to drive home the point that this isn't just an oceans problem. This is a freshwater problem. This is an air problem. This is a soil problem. This is a human problem. Um, This is, you know, making its way into our food. Um, It's making its way into our children. Um, And so this um, is a really important thing for us to kind of focus on and and solve. Um, And what's crazy about this problem um, is that it's it's kind of simple. <laughs> the solutions um, really kind of start with, with people. Um, I, I like to bring this idea home of, um, you know, if you come home and you see um, your kitchen sink overflowing with water just everywhere, what's the first thing you're going to do? And we all know the first thing you're going to do is you're going to run to the tap and you're going to turn it off. You're not going to start with cleanup. You're going to start by turning off the water because cleaning up the water makes no sense until you stop the flow of water. And we have to have the same approach when it comes to plastic. Um, So we are the problem. You know, every piece of plastic I find in the environment ultimately comes down to the items that we use um, and the items that we inevitably lose. Um, so that also means that we are the solution. Um, and really kind of thinking about where does plastic, you know, what's how is plastic used? So going back to this uh, chart I showed earlier from National Geographic, um, the different colors show you the different types of um ways that plastic is used, and I wanted to draw your attention to this, the biggest contributor of plastic usage, which is packaging, like plastic bags, <laughs> right? Um, this is the, the, the most significant contributor. 
contributor um, to plastic usage in the world. Um, it's also the, the, the area where plastic is used for the shortest amount of time. So we're taking this material that lasts for hundreds of years and we're using it to make items that we use for minutes. That disconnect is a huge problem. Um, so we really need to focus on getting rid of these single-use disposable items, um, you know, avoiding um, buying them, avoiding using them, um, and then advocating for um, changes to be done um, on a bigger level, right? you got to start with yourself. If you're not willing to change yourself, then you can't ask other people to make changes. Um, but so we start with ourselves, um, and from there, then we can push for changes to happen at a, at a legislative level. Um, for like example, um, I'm a big advocate of extended corporate responsibility. If you make it, you have to be responsible for getting rid of it. Um, with that, I want to thank you. And open it up for questions. <coughs> Are there any questions? I went through that really fast. <laughs> it was an interesting lecture, but... <laughs> Okay, then I'm assuming that means no question. Question. Okay, then thank you for coming and offering us this amazing lecture. No problem. Thank you for having me. And then on the point of what Dr. Mason was talking about in terms of that the reason we need to reduce plastic pollution, if any of you want to join us for our session at 6 p.m., we'll be talking about a citizen science initiative in order to attempt to target the reduction of the most major plastic producers. And then I believe the next lecture is at 11 a.m. So if you want to rejoin us then, then you're welcome. And uh, Ben became interested in climate change by gardening at his home and his visits to Phipps Conservatory. In his free time, Ben likes to bike, a read, and kayak. All right, with that, the bee, take it away. Thank you.
And it, while it may not seem like that much, you have to consider the high output of the manufacturing industry and how much trash is already in the oceans. Something as small as five millimeters makes a major difference at such a high volume. This amounts to tons of pollution in the sea. They further constrict the ecosystem by being consumed by various organisms. If smaller microorganisms ingest these microplastic pieces, they carry that plastic within them as they are consumed by members higher in the food chain. This food chain extends to humans, which can cause physical harm upon consumption. The world is reaching a point of no return, and it's up to us and future generations to make the difference needed to ensure that we never reach this point. So on the bottom right picture, you can see a picture of someone holding these microplastics. They can be really small and you can't even see them certain times, but then they can also be quite big. As you can see, it was this was found on the, the stomach of a fish. So now I'm going to talk about a few major voices in, in this region. Some people are paving enormous paths for us to follow and inspire to do the same. These four are taking environmental change to the next level. On the top right is Brianna Fruayan. She is one of the youngest youth activists in the Pacific region and sits on the Council of Elders for the Pacific Climate Warriors as a youth representative. She stated that she does what she does because the Pacific community are not only the people who are most affected by climate change, but also those who are most familiar with how to be resilient in the face of its impact. If we can save the Pacific, we can save the world. She's a prime example of how you can protect your home when something really matters to you and take responsibility and just generally help create change. She works to protect her community and that reach spreads beyond to the world. Moving to the top left is Greta Thunberg. Many of you know her as she is more portrayed in the light of the media. She started off protesting in the front of the Swedish parliament building until the Swedish government met the carbon emissions target agreed upon in the Paris 2015 convention. After her protest gained some traction, she went on to speak at the UN to bring light to the situation we find ourselves in. She continues to encourage others to help the environment. She's a prime example of how informing others of this issue can have a major help and help solve this issue. On the bottom right is Ben Stern. He created a product that is biodegradable and can hold various necessities such as soap and shampoo. His product eliminates the need for plastic as it dissolves in water to make it as environmental friendly as possible. And finally, on the bottom left is Enric Sala. Sala is a quite a prominent figure in environmental science as he created the Pristine Seas Project in 2008 to explore and help save the last wild and remote places in the ocean. He preserves these places in the ocean and makes them a sanctuary so the ecosystem can repair itself and generally stay untouched by humans. So now I have a question for everyone. If you want to, you can answer in the chat. Um, if we were politicians, ambassadors, leaders of the world, how could you aid the environment? What motions would you pass? You can answer this as if you had one of these roles or if you had the platform some of the people I previously mentioned did. Personally, what I was thinking about of what I would do is a lot of products that we see, like plastic bags, they are because of um, the manufacturing industry. So I would offer an incentive to use more environmental friendly products, like bring your own black bag, um, change to a biodegradable form of the plastic, something like that, and therefore we could cut it down at its source. Carbon taxes, nice. Yeah. The Paris Agreement, yeah. And finally, there's what, what can we do? It seems like there are so many more problems than those willing to help solve them, but there are things that we can do to make a more efficient impact on the environment. At a local level, you can do so much. For one, limit how much single-use plastic you use. You can replace it with mason jars or containers of that nature to reuse. Even with plastic bags, I know my mom reuses the extra plastic bags we get at grocery stores as trash bags. 
So finding some unique use to reuse them and give another role. And in a world where economy and industry play such a large role in our society, if you refuse to buy a single-use plastic item, you help businesses by letting them know that you would rather them offer alternatives, environmentally safe alternatives. You can also avoid products containing plastic microbeads by looking for polyethylene and polypropylene on the ingredients label of your cosmetic products. I've attached a link at the end of the slide containing a list of these products. Um, and at a higher level, you can support those enabling climate activism and encourage their movements. The more support these projects have, the more impact they can make. And if you want to go one step further, be the person to start one of these projects or an organization. Some of the people I've mentioned are high schoolers. Everyone can contribute in some way or another. You just have to think about what you have to contribute to society. Thank you so much for listening. I hope this was helpful um, and you enjoyed it. These are a few links that you can go to. That these, The fourth link is a list of the products with microbeads, and some of these are resources that you can use if you want to learn more. And I think that means you're up. All right. Uh, first of all, thank you, Abby. That was a great presentation. Um, definitely very interesting how uh, plastics and the environment are getting into the, the fish that we have in the ocean. Um, let me start presenting here. Okay, everyone see that? So I'm going to be talking about recycling in a sort of beer economy. Um, so if you're a race like me, every Earth Day, we get this little checklist that could have fit on a bookmark with things that we could have done to save the environment. Like take shorter showers, turn off the sink when you brush your teeth, turn the lights off when you leave the room, and please recycle. Um, I used to love these as a kid because I was scientifically minded and because I felt like I was doing something. Um, I think they always, always had something like that too. I don't know what that was about. Um, but we're really at a point where no amount of turning off the sink while we brush our teeth will save us. And so what's the point I'm getting at? We become somewhat complacent um, with this sort of toothbrush activism while most of our lives are going unchanged. Um, we can't really accept these solutions when there's a one in 500 year hurricane every year or when there's fires in the West every year that are rec topping records um, just in the United States. So today I'd like to talk about the modern state of recycling and how we can um, take changes to make an actual difference. So I'm going to start off with the current perception of recycling, which is usually that what you put in the bin goes into a local recycling plant where they uh, take it, they kind of crush it up, and they make everything new again. Uh, so I'm going to start by sort of addressing those misconceptions because there's a lot to unpack in that sentence, and then I'm going to expand on that from there. So first, most recycled material is actually shipped to China. Um, so that happened until recently, about uh, January 2018, when they tighten restrictions to uh, ban certain plastics altogether, and they tighten some quality restrictions. So secondly, how much is recycled is a lot, uh, varies a lot by type. So China stopped importing plastics in part of an, in part of an environmental policy change to uh, stop importing foreign trash in January 2018. Uh, so this disrupted most of the American supply chain, and most of our recycling is actually going to landfill due, due to a lack of demand. So the only recycling allowed in China must be at most 0.5% contaminated. So compared to what's normally in our recycling, it's about 25% contaminated. So um, this combined with what is called aspirational recycling or recycling has caused a problem where um, counterintuitively uh, recycling uh, plants are kind of telling people to not recycle certain products which might be lower grade or um, slightly contaminated just because they can't, the labor cost it to um, take it out versus quality. So the second point that is in that sentence is that even if you know nothing about recycling, you can probably see that some of these materials are more valuable than others. So batteries are at an, about a 99% recycling rate. So granted, if you throw them out, they're not going to get recycled. But if you do put them in a recycling uh, drop-off, they will get reused because they're valuable, right? That's just how the economy works um, with the, the cost of recycling. Uh, whereas cheaper things like paper and glass, uh, paper's at about 66%, while glass is at about 27%. So most of your paper is going to be reused 
but not all of it. Um, and the other thing about paper is that it biodegrades. So um, paper does have a negative impact when you throw it away, but it's not as severe as plastics, which currently are only being reused at 9%. Um, this is a completely like uh, um, impossible level to be at, right? Because we can't just, uh, just throw away all this plastic. Um, and the main issue is that recycling isn't being done morally, it's being done economically. So plastic in particular is more expensive to recycle than to create again. So in addition, plastic degrades each time it's recycled. So even if you were recycling it, its lifetime would be limited. Um, it's not food safe, also recycled plastic. So all those milk cartons, those uh, water bottles, those berry baskets, they're not made out of anything renewable. Um, so that's, there's just no way that that can be circular. Um, so some solutions to this problem are, uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, just following these guidelines and recycling what you can won't be doing enough to solve the current crisis. So what we're seeing is that we have at its core an economic problem. Supply and demand for recycling are way out of whack. So following this thread, how can we incentivize recycling from an economic standpoint? Um, the good part is that there's already ideas and innovations in the works. So first, um, there's a company called Goop Industries that's currently trying to solve the food safety issue. And this is trying to address the problem that I mentioned earlier, which is mainly that uh, recycled plastic is not food safe. So this creates a situation where even if we recycled everything else, which we aren't doing at all. Um, oh, uh -oh. <laughs> better turn on my slide again. Um, so even if we aren't, even if we aren't, uh, even for recycling everything else, um, the food issue is going to be a problem. So what the industries is doing is breaking down each plastic into its individual polymers and then recreating them. And what this does is help create a more circular economy. And the economic forces of this are the prices go down for uh, food, food grade materials and the demand goes up. Um, next, a recycle content mandate, which California recently tried to introduce, um, would implement a, a guarantee for certain recycling materials. So um like plastic bottles um other like um food items would have to be about 10 to 50 percent recycled over time um this would gradually increase from about 10 to 50 percent so what this would do is lead to an increased demand for recycling across the state um the bill was unfortunately vetoed in 2019 but this does have potential to be implemented in the future and what this would do is just kind of uh, artificially kind of pick that demand up. So that would uh, conversely kind of increase the, the supply. Um, and then finally, I think this is the best option. Uh, we have the carbon tax. So this is already being implemented in a lot of countries around the world. Um, a purposely increasing carbon tax, which has been proposed by a lot of economists, is, um, would make these options that are uh, cleaner, cheaper relative to some other products that are not. So this creates increased demand for recycled products because your, your rational mind basically just picks a cheaper option. But um, what you're also doing is sort of incentivizing that cleaner in your process. So this creates the most natural choice driven option in my opinion to help create recycling survive in the United States. So what this does, as I already told you, prices down relative to single use plastics and the demand goes up. Um, so now to go to some resources, um, first of all, there's some great resources out there, but one of the best resources is, is you, even though that sounds kind of, kind of dumb. Um, but really politicians listen to handwritten letters and meetings in person, the most when they're making their decisions a lot more than lobbying or, um, some other process. So if you feel passionate about these issues, it's just important to let your reps know. Um, most often just the best way to do is write a letter. So I have put the find your reps link on there. And I know some people are saying, like, oh, what do I say? Um, and what you can do is um, I put another thing that says, what do I say? And that'll take you to an environmental action website. And if you're too lazy to write a letter, I completely understand. Um, it'll just give you a template and you can just fill it out. <laughs> um, next, we have the carbon dividend action, which takes you to the citizens' climate lobby. It's a bipartisan lobby trying to about this carbon tax, um, just give you some information about the issues and what's going on. Um, last thing we have the recycling rules by address because I mentioned that aspirational recycling is a big problem. Um, 
so if you know what you can and can't recycle, that helps out the plants a lot just because they have higher quality materials. Um, and then, yeah, if you want to download these slides, I think there's a link in the in the um, doc somewhere. And um, you can go download them and just click on the links from there and also the photo credits on the bottom. So as I started my discussion, change the world from home is going to change the world. So the good news is that we don't have to be the first ones to implement these sort of climate options. Um, and we've seen that a lot of these work around the world. So with carbon taxes, Canada, the EU, Australia, China, and Japan have already implemented these. And they seem to be working fine. Um, so while the news in the U.S. hasn't been great for recycling in the past years, there is room for hope in the world as we explore better options to better our one and only planet. Thank you. Thank you all for speaking. If there are any questions, those can occur at this time. Okay, I'm assuming that means no questions. So thank you again for speaking, and I believe there are a variety of links about the World Affairs Council and many of their opportunities in the comments if you desire to take a closer look at those. I think we'll get started and hope that more people join throughout the session. But basically, as an introduction to what we're doing, today is World Cleanup Day, but obviously this year's circumstances are excruciating and we can't necessarily host a cleanup. So instead, we decided to host a virtual lecture series. We're Bye Bye Plastic Bags Pennsylvania, a branch of Bye Bye Plastic Bags International, which is a United Nations affiliated non-governmental organization. All of our contact information is there, and it's basically to have youth around the world say no to plastic bags and promote a lack of plastic pollution. But in addition to today being World Cleanup Day, it is the 19th day of Hunger Month, and as a result, I thought it would be best for us to have some form of representation of that in this, especially because hunger is particularly bad during the coronavirus pandemic. As a component, though, we have representatives of the World Food Price Foundation today with addressing hunger and food insecurity overall. Basically, the World Food Price Foundation's mission is to elevate innovation and inspire action to sustainability and in order to increase the quantity, quality, and availability of food for all. It was initially founded off of the ideals of Dr. Norman Borlaug, who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970 for his work in global agriculture, and he basically envisioned a prize that would honor those who have made significant and measurable contributions to increasing the world's food supply. Hence the World Food Prize, which was created in 1986 with sponsorship by the General Foods Corporation. Overall, the World Food Prize does a lot of work to date with a lot of different items, including a lot of youth initiatives, of which I have been a participant in the past and I highly recommend, but today we have the World Food Prize with us. Wonderful, Sharia. Actually, um, we flipped for it and, and I won, so I get to start first. And um, so I'll start with my presentation and then we'll follow up with Keegan Kowski from the World Food Prize Foundation, if that's okay. Okay, so I'm going to share select screen. How do I know? Okay, let's try that one. All right, so hopefully this comes up correctly. We can see it. Awesome, wonderful. Can you see me, by the way? No. Okay, that's all right. Um, and I dressed up for you. You should see the gown that I'm in. Anyway, so hello, everyone. My name is Jenna Fleo, and I'm the director of the Pennsylvania Youth Institute connected to the World Food Prize Foundation. I would like to thank Bye Bye Plastics for inviting me to speak today. So let's get started with connecting the dots. So food insecurity, food insecurity, uh, as, as, as I'm uh, connected to the World Food Prize Foundation, you'll be hearing from Keegan Kowski on how he 
he's going to outline the global challenge of food insecurity. On our local level, to bring awareness and discussion, my team in the Pennsylvania Youth Institute coordinates and encourages discussions about the lack of access to nutritious foods due to many factors, from human rights to environmental impacts. But one topic should not be overlooked, and that's food waste, and actually connected to that food loss. So how is it that so many people don't have access to nutritious food, while others that do waste it and waste what they have? Almost half of our food is wasted in the United States. How does that happen? What can we do to solve this enormous food waste problem? You know, the, the percentages vary from study to study, but roughly the United States of America wastes 40% of food, nutritious food. Additionally, besides the food waste that we have in retail businesses or restaurants, and, and then even in our households, food is lost. And it's lost for a very a variety of reasons. On the farms, it could be bad weather or processing problems, overproduction, unstable markets can cause food loss, and um, it could be lost before it even comes to the, the grocery store. While overbuying and poor planning and food safety contribute to food waste at stores and in homes. So as you know, with Bye Bye Plastics, nothing is easy. There are complications to the solution. Risk management manages risk through standards of food safety. We have to think about expiration dates and packaging as, as you do. So just imagine this, a food bank cannot accept food that has expired, even though we might eat that food if in our own homes after the expiration date. You cannot go to a butcher shop and get a nice fresh piece of um, steak, have it wrapped in paper, and be able to donate it. There's also other programs where hunters can donate uh, deer that they have, they have uh, hunted, but unfortunately, food banks and due to regulations, they can't share that with people who would love to have that fresh piece of steak. So there are some recovery organizations working to reduce food waste worldwide. Think about it. Food waste creates environmental problems. As food decomposes in landfills, it releases methane, which is 27 times more potent than carbon monoxide as a greenhouse gas. Check out organizations like the, the 412 Food Rescue in Pittsburgh to Food Loop in Cologne, Germany, and many others. At this website, the Food Tank is an organization, it's a think tank for food. So I mentioned locally, and I think that a lot of problems that we have should start locally. We can start local and grow our partnerships across the world. In your own home, learn how to reduce waste when you're cooking with less waste ideas. Try preparing meals and shopping in advance and other tips that create that zero waste kitchen. And learn how to compost at home. Or you can see if your local government has a composting program that you can participate in. In addition to local organizations and farms, see if they to have a food drop off and waste. In my own town, I know that we have actually glass, a grass clipping, and um, you can take your grass clippings to this location and they compost it into humus that then you can come pick and, and put in into your flower gardens. So there's different ways and different uh, locations locally that you can do that. So how might we connect the dots? As I said, you'll learn more about food insecurity with Keegan Kowski from the World Food Price Foundation. 
when thinking about the food waste that we actually waste almost half of our food in the United States and then recover that waste in a, in a great way that that will save money will save environment so how might we connect the dots let's find our way to feed the world and reduce the waste while impacting the environment thank you Awesome. Thanks, Jenna. And I want to share my screen here so we can find the available. So again, we know 
know this is a really serious problem. Every 10 seconds, a kid dies somewhere on the planet because of hunger. And we know that one in nine people will go to bed hungry tonight. But it's, it's more complex than that. It's more complicated than that. In the United States, so, you know, here is one of the wealthiest civilizations that has ever existed in human history. Um, incredible resource wealth and economic wealth. And yet 50 million Americans are food insecure right now. 50 million people in this country, one of the wealthiest on the planet. And yet it is still a very serious problem. And again, this is a reality for every country that exists. Food insecurity is affecting every country. And the households that are often hit the hardest are households with children. And again, this is in every country on the planet. But if there are children in a household, they are significantly more likely to be food insecure. And the way this plays out is also interesting because we see big differences depending on the race and gender and age of individuals and how hunger and food insecurity affects them. So for, here's an example in the United States. We know that one in seven children in America are food insecure. But we also know that for Latino children, that number is one in six. So overall in the United States, one in seven kids is food insecure. But for Hispanic and Latino families in America, it's one in six children are food insecure. For African American children, that number is one in four. So there is a very real racial disparity in how food insecurity and hunger is experienced. Not just in America, but around the world populations that are marginalized or discriminated against or don't have the same historic access to opportunities and income experience hunger in much deeper and more uh, harsh ways. In the U.S. we know, for example, that African-American households are more than twice as likely to be food insecure compared to white households. So again, there's a lot more complexity to this story than we sometimes think about. And it's also not just about families with children and the experience of hunger and food insecurity for kids. We know that one of the most affected populations in every country on the planet that are the elderly and older citizens. And again, one of the things that is uniquely challenging for an older person who is oftentimes living on a fixed income is that they, they often have to choose between medical care and food. So with a limited budget, they have to make very tough decisions and oftentimes, the immediate need for medical care comes at then the cost of having adequate nutrition. And that obviously then affects health, because if we're not getting the nutrients our body needs and enough food, then it's creating more complications related to our health. One of the other kind of misconceptions that's really common is we think of food insecurity and hunger as an urban problem or an issue of urban poverty. But actually, Rural households in most countries are more likely to be food insecure and hungry than urban households. So again, this is, this is part of the irony that is really sad when we look at the entire world. There are hundreds of millions of smallholder farmers who are actually oftentimes the most food insecure people in a country. So the people who are oftentimes growing the food and raising the animals that we eat are themselves the most food insecure and don't have enough for themselves. So again, this irony around the world and in our own countries and our own communities that the people that are oftentimes producing the food need don't have enough for themselves. So again, as we think about this and this broader definition of, of what is food security, you know, we define food security as it exists when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that both meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. So again, it has several different components. It's about access, it's about quality and safety, it's about availability and affordability. All of those components have to exist for food security to actually exist for a family to be realized. Uh, the last thing I want to just talk about quickly um, before we open it up for some, some questions is to think about where are, we, where are we at in the world right now and how are we doing? So here's kind of a quick overview because it's, it's easy to focus on those problems, right? And to focus on what's not working. But I think this is really interesting. Since 1990, we've been able to reduce hunger by half in a 
over 80 developing countries around the world. And you can see on this map where that is, where this progress has been made. This map is a few years old now. So actually in South America and Central America, where those, those countries are, are marked in yellow, those are now green. So again, we are actually making great strides in reducing hunger and food insecurity around the world in this way. That being said, we were making a lot of progress until the COVID-19 pandemic hit. And a lot of the gains we've made over the last 20 years have actually now are at risk of being lost um, just this year. So again, our food systems are so vulnerable. Hunger is a real, uh, a very real reality for a lot of families, especially now that jobs are being lost or our economic mobility is limited because of this pandemic. And so again, these repercussions led their, their way out through the food system and into our communities and into our households in a lot of different ways. But again, we are, as a mega trend, making a lot of really interesting progress. In the same way, we're reducing child mortality pretty substantially. And again, this goes back to better nutrition for children. We've been able to save the lives of over 120 million children in the last 20 years. So again, we know that what we're doing is working. Extreme poverty is declining by over 75%. We're seeing that progress all over the planet. I'm jumping through this quickly because I want to make sure we have lots of good time for discussion. Um, and again, the number of hungry people up until the pandemic was being significantly reduced around the world in every region. So again, I think it's a really interesting story as we think about this as a persistent problem that we are facing in all of our countries and all of our communities, most of our families. And now with the pandemic, all the progress that we've been making has been lost. So we really have to now respond to that in a big way. We know what can work. We know what can solve this problem. The question is, are we going to learn from that and now put it to action in our own communities to make a real difference? So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen so we can see each other. But as we're thinking about this bigger picture of the World Cleanup Day, in addressing all these problems, right, we can't solve hunger in isolation or by itself. We can't address food waste, like Jennifer was talking about, by itself. All of these issues are interconnected, right? Gender equality, access to education, clean water and sanitation, ending poverty, making sure that everyone has food security and so there is zero hunger in the world. All of these sustainable development goals are going to be achieved if we pursue solutions that are integrated, that are building on each other, so that our efforts to address poverty are helping end hunger, and our efforts to improve clean water access and sanitation are empowering girls and improving access to education at the same time. All of this work needs to happen in tandem so that we can be most effective. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen here so we can open it up for questions. All right. Does anyone have anything they want to ask for Jennifer or I? Any issues they want to, to discuss or maybe you have an idea you want to share something you're doing in your community? I, I love the way you tied in local hunger because I think that's an overlooked uh, thought when we're thinking when we're discussing food insecurity. So thank you for bringing that up. Absolutely. You know, Janet, when you were talking about food waste, it's it's, it's interesting. Even when I when I think about it, and we, we know all these interesting things that work in the world to make a difference. And I think it, it surprises a lot of people when they realize that actually, if we just wasted less, that would actually make the biggest possible difference towards ending hunger in the world, right? If we didn't throw 30% or 40% of our food in the garbage or didn't, you know, let it rot or spoil before it gets to, um, gets to our plate, um, that would actually almost, you know, what, um, almost double basically the food supply that's available to people and it significantly reduce the cost of food for everyone. Right, right. So conversations like this become really important along with um, use of plastics uh, as this organization does because that's where it starts. Um, a lot of times people buy groceries and they're not really thinking about the individual use and then that might yield into waste of food. And so having these conversations, bringing these topics up, making awareness, educating, um, is the beginning of how we can impact. You're so right. right. You know, I, and, 
I think that's actually something that we don't often think about, um, especially in other countries. You know, we take for granted the fact that we over process and we, you know, over package everything, right? Um, when we buy something at the grocery store, it probably comes in at least two different packages one that's probably plastic and then one that might be cardboard or something else. You know, outside of that, if you think about a box of cereal or something else. And, and it's interesting because in the last 50 years, a lot of our food industry and companies and others and the public thought, you know, that that was really this incredible innovation, you know, that we were pursuing, right? Because it does improve oftentimes food safety or food quality. You can reduce spoilage, you know, with the right packaging. But because we weren't paying attention to, will this ever biodegrade? You know, what's the the, um, the other consequences of all of this packaging you know, being, being used and then dumped? What actually is that gonna, you know, create in new problems? And so it's interesting, I think for a long time, people were really focusing on that packaging as the innovation, um, even though it was really creating this incredible problem and they weren't focusing on, are there ways that we could preserve food quality and safety and better, you know, have this, but do it with packaging that can biodegrade, do it with packaging that isn't going to actually harm ourselves or, or water or, or plants and animals in this way in the long term. Um, so unfortunately, this is really kind of a revolutionary idea, even though it's something we should have realized 80 years ago. Exactly, yes. So I'm wondering, the people that are listening, if, if we were able to bring up thoughts um, and ideas that we, motivate you to think about how this could collaborate, how we can uh, work together with my wife plastics to bring food security and food waste. How to bring it down. So, I, I always enjoy um, hearing about food security and your views, Megan. Well, I'll be interested to see if, you know, I mean, obviously there's a lot that's been happening, especially when we think about packaging and using, whether it's mushrooms or other fungus, you know, um, using using even, you know, byproducts of, of food and plant products that we know could biodegrade more easily and have less harm, and at the same time, be creating a market for smallholder producers and farmers and families around the world. So you're actually creating a new source of income and alternative ways for them to develop those products. Um, so they can still sell, you know, whether it's whether it's you know corn or soybeans or millet or sorghum or, or something else um, that can then be converted into this so that we can reduce our reliance on um, on on plastics and create some of these new products that can provide that same packaging, um, that same service but in a way that, that doesn't have that harm. So I'm excited about a lot of those prospects, but the problem is we haven't put enough money in research dollars from governments and from private industries haven't been investing at the same levels to create those new technologies as we really need them to. So it's gonna to have to be an area of increased investment in the future at a lot of different levels, politically at the government level and by private sector corporations and others to actually see the need and then create the products that'll actually help solve the problem. Great, great. Yes. Well, I want to thank Bye Bye Plastics Program for inviting us to speak and sharing about things that we're passionate about and look forward to seeing how Bye Bye Plastics impacts waste in the world and um, impacts Pennsylvania. So thank you. Thank you for coming and that was an amazing lecture and discussion and simply overarchingly an amazing set of advice when it comes to addressing hunger and food insecurity internationally as well as locally. But I think there's also a good note to move on to the next item that we have scheduled, which we're working with Break Free from Plastic for World Cleanup Day with the current context of the entire situation in order to make sure that we can conduct World Cleanup Day in a better way. And we're doing that through a citizen science project. So I shall share my screen.
Okay, so Break Free from Plastic is an international organization that is currently conducting a global movement in order to envision a future free from plastic pollution. Since its launch in 2016, more than 8,000 organizations and individual supporters from across the world have joined the movement to demand massive reductions in single-use plastics and to push for lasting solutions to the plastic pollution crisis. Break Free from Plastics, specifically in the context of World Cleanup Day currently and in the context of this entire month, is conducting an international brand audit. So basically the idea is that we need to focus not upon simply collecting plastic, but making sure that we reduce plastic pollution in the far future. And part of that is trying to trace the source from which all of the plastic is coming from. A brand audit is basically a citizen science initiative that involves counting and documenting the brands on plastic waste collected at a cleanup to identify the companies responsible for plastic pollution. In the past few years, that's often directed themselves directly at companies such as Coca-Cola and necessarily in terms of this is a way to tell those companies to reduce the plastic pollution that they're creating and the plastic crisis that's then pushed onto the consumers. It's a way to flip the narrative that basically says that it's a consumer problem, that consumers need to reduce their waste into a problem of this is a systemic problem, and it's time for producers to reduce the amount of waste that they're basically pushing onto us in a commercial world filled with advertising. Specifically, the goals of this initiative are to firstly shift the narrative, secondly, hold companies accountable, and thirdly, build a global movement. All of the bioplastic bags groups, indeed all 50 teams around the world are currently participating in this, and in Pennsylvania, we'll be conducting our own brand audit from September 19th through 30th. So in this time period, I encourage you to just keep track of the waste that you're producing at home. So it's not necessary that you go out in a cleanup, especially because of COVID-19, but if you just keep track of the waste that you're producing and the companies that are producing it, please enter it into our spreadsheet at tinyurl.com slash BFFP-PA. The link is there and it's also on the document. And then with that, we'll be able to effectively be able to categorize all of this and make sure that the companies at fault are held responsible. So if there's any questions about that, then. We would love for all of you to participate in the brand audit just as a way to continue this into the next few days. But that largely concludes our lecture series. And if you had any questions for myself, and I suppose since Janet and Keegan are still here, if you had any questions for them as well, you can ask them. Whether you attended live or have been watching these recordings, throughout the past few hours in terms of the situation on YouTube. Thank you for attending our virtual lecture series with Bye Bye Plastic Bags Pennsylvania. For more information about our organization, please visit www.bybyplasticbags.org. If you want to email our team specifically on any future initiatives or volunteering opportunities and other similar items, please contact us at Bye Bye Plastic Bags or more specifically BBPB Pennsylvania at gmail.com. Again, that's BBPB Pennsylvania at gmail.com. Thank you for joining us and thank you to all of our lecturers as well. Their contact information will be below and thank you again.